Pushkin. Over the course of a 35-year career, Damon Albarn has reached international fame with two very different groups. In 1988, Damon created the rock band Blur with four friends in his native London. Blur started out as what Damon calls a classic art school band, but they quickly morphed into one of the seminal groups of the 90s Britpop explosion, along with their former rivals, Oasis. After a series of successful albums with Blur, Damon started Gorillas in 1998 with cartoonist Jamie Hewlett. Dubbed as the world's first virtual group, the Gorillas' rotating lineup includes collaborations with De La Soul, Stevie Nicks, Bobby Womack, and Lou Reed. The band's influences are as diverse as electronic music, hip-hop, and world music, and over the last 25 years, Gorillas has been wildly successful, selling over 30 million albums worldwide. Despite having found such success, Damon's never stopped exploring his artistic potential. He's written an opera, released solo and side projects, and recently he reunited with Blur to release the band's latest album called The Ballad of Darren. On today's episode, Leah Rose talks to Damon Albarn about what it's like for Blur to headline music festivals in 2023. Damon also reveals how gorillas are about to undergo a major paradigm shift. And he explains how, according to family lore, John Lennon and Yoko Ono first met at his dad's art gallery in London. This is Broken Record, liner notes for the digital age. I'm Justin Richmond. Here's Leah Rose with Damon Albarn. Let's talk Blur. Okay. So it looks like you've been on a, uh, you all have been doing a little run of shows in Europe. How has it been being back on stage with everybody? Oh, it's great. Yeah, we did three, four small gigs in in England, and then we went over to Spain and did the Primavera gigs. First one was Barcelona. I mean, the the only problem problematic thing is that if you're headlining, you go on at two a.m. God, which which at our age is almost unthinkable, but we can just about do it. Yeah. And then the next date was in Madrid, and it was the first time they were ever doing it, and uh, the weather was so bad that they had to cancel our concert at 2 a.m. So we managed to find a a smallish club called La Riviera, about 2,000 people, and uh, 2,000 of the 40,000 managed to see us. So it was quite a a magical evening, really, considering what a tumultuous afternoon it had been, you know. What was the energy like in the club? Yeah, it was fantastic. I threw myself around with wild abandon. Very nice. How has it been for the other guys in the band? Because I know you've been consistently touring for the most part since the last Blur album. Has it been thought, hard for I them thought you, to sort of... I thought you were going to say you've been consistently tearing it up. <laughs> <laughs> you've been thrashing, yeah. tearing the club up. Yeah. Consistently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I mean, everyone's been doing stuff their own thing. Graham's done a lot of concerts, mm-hmm. but not maybe of that size. Mm-hmm. Alex has his own festival, so he even he knows everything about about what a festival is, you know, the complete DNA of a festival. And Dave's been doing everything humanly possible and also got his own little band out as well. So everyone's been super busy. That's great. Yeah, well, it's necessary, isn't it? Otherwise, it just feels like... I don't know, this this is supposed to be old friends sort of finding each other latterly and uh, trying to express that in a sort of, you know, vibrant and honest way. Have you learned anything new about the old friends in the process of recording the new album? (sighs) Well, they're a lot more grown up, all of them, a lot more maybe resilient than maybe they were... 20 years ago, emotionally and physically. Yeah, I think there's a huge amount of necessary growing up that's gone on for all of us. Are the band dynamics, do they feel exactly the same as they used to, you know, way back when? Or have things sort of changed just like on a more like interpersonal level? Things have changed a bit, but uh, essentially it's still exactly the same dynamic. That's so cool. It's so nice to have that. Yeah, it's re- it is really nice. It is really nice, and it, but 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 I suppose uh, 
the fact that we haven't kind of chased it much <laughs> in the last 20 years means that, you know, there's, there's still that possibility for something to surprise us, you know? And, I mean, this whole thing initially started off with a conversation about, okay, it's probably time we sang those songs again with no real destination. And then when I was in the States in the autumn... I mean, I always take a studio on, on tour anyway, and I just thought, well, I'm just going to write songs. It's kind of interesting being here hmm. in all these mad cities and everything that, that, you know, that you carry on the road with you and the experiences you have. And I thought maybe that's quite a nice... Sometimes it's quite a nice place to write about something else, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just wrote lots of songs. I didn't tell anyone... And then in the new year, I said to all of them, I said, Let's just can I invite you down to the studio? I'd just like to play you some stuff, see what you think. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, look, I've, I think I've written an album. There's 20 songs. You choose the ones you want to record. Mm -hmm. And that's really, it was as simple as that. They were like into it. And it felt, I suppose, at that moment, I was kind of, you know, I was still kind of a bit nervous about letting all that material go without knowing where it was going to go. But uh, mm -hmm. it, went, it went pretty much exactly where I, where I hoped it would. And, uh, yeah, I didn't take us more than six weeks to do the whole thing. It's amazing. Uh, and, and, but the most amazing thing about that was that that seemed to sort of inform the, the, the momentum of everything and the fact that we already had this sort of totemic Wembley gig it's sort of everyone was like, oh, well we, well, we should get the record out in time for that as well, or okay. at least least proximity to it. So something, a process that, 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 that latterly, to be honest, has just become so sort of slow for me, you know, like having to wait a year sometimes mm -hmm. to put a record out. She's just, and that's happened a few times. So this was literally, we, we finished it, and then it was like, oh, shit, we need to rehearse for these concerts, mm -hmm. and now we're here. And I haven't, and, and we're putting another single out next week and then the album. And that's, it's just nice to know that, that nothing existed in January apart from the songs, I suppose. So the gig existed first and then the album yeah. came. Yes. So it's sort of like a, a Beatles get back, let it be situation. It's exactly like that. And it's just I'm watching good. Get Back right now. <laughs> I mean, it's inevitable, isn't it? That's sort of for some reason, because we come from this island. Yeah. We're always going, but but I mean, this is the annoying thing about the Beatles is that they kind of sort of they created every kind of sort of trope that That's you right. throw at pop music, really. You know, not invented, but they seem to embody so many. And you know, the the idea of mass hysteria, although it happened previously with Elvis, I don't think it ever happened for a band. The idea of the independence that a band, when it's a good one, kind of offers its its audience you know they know that these these individuals have come up together and that they share very similar kind of sort of beliefs you know and mm -hmm. passions and that like you know they've known each other since they were kids so it's just yeah it's so important really that bands exist and i suppose i feel like i don't know i feel like there's a bit more excitement about guitar music again at the moment yeah and uh, that can't be a bad thing because it got so sterile. I mean, you know, for me, really, the, the last great guitar band would have been the Arctic Monkeys. I don't really know if there's anything as good as that since. I mean, but, but now there's bands who look, have got a huge amount of potential and it's really, it's kind of dismantled itself, guitar music, and it's kind of putting itself back together again in a different form, you know. Mm -hmm. and you get, you've got some fantastic new kind of sort of mutations of, of, of the, the genus of it. Yeah, what are some that you're thinking of when you say there's new, there's some new bands out there that are bringing back guitar music? Well, I, re I, really, like, uh, I, I really like a band like Wooloo. They seem to be really cool. There's one that I picked up on somewhere in the American countryside, but I like, but I can't remember his name. <laughs> That's narrowing it down, isn't it? Um, <laughs> American countryside, okay. Yeah, an American countryside, the great, the great American countryside. Yeah. It's a collective of, I don't know, it's sort of 
just felt like exactly what a young band should sound like. Lots of, there were lots of them. And you've got bands like Yard Act who are here who seem to be getting better and better. And obviously, like, not that they're new, but I still see them as kind of emerging bands like Sleaford Mods, you know, brilliant. So it's like, and, and lots of great language being used again, you know, not this sort of generic rock shit. I hate that. Yeah. I hate that. I like, I like poets and guitars, you know. It's like, that's what always inspired, inspired me. I was curious about your relationship to the Beatles because you came up, you were sort of the generation after the Beatles. And we've had a lot of artists on this show who talk about, you know, someone like Ozzy Osbourne, when he heard the Beatles, it was like it went from black and white to color. So you being and then, and then the back gener- to, and, and then back to black <laughs> permanently. <laughs> he brought it back to black. But yeah, I'm not sure where the color comes in really with Ozzy Osbourne, but I mean, yeah, you know. So they still put out albums while you were alive, young, but you were yeah. alive. Uh, well, but, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Growing yeah. up when when you were finding your own music, what role did the Beatles play with you and your friends? Like, were you guys into the Beatles? Well, the first thing I knew about the Beatles really was that my parents lived in the same mansion block in Empress Gate back in the very early 60s as them. Wow. And uh, then what's my next connection? My, the other thing within my family kind of sort of folklore is that my dad had a gallery in just off Carnaby Street and he put on the exhibition where uh, Yoko Ono had the ladder and... John Lennon climbed up a ladder to to read the word yes or whatever it was. So kind of he kind of got them together. That was their first meeting. Really? Yeah, I mean obviously it's it's not. I've been dying not, to know how those two met watching Get Back. Yeah, they met in 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 he came to see her art show at my dad's gallery. Was she like a, a popular artist at the time? I mean underground, yeah. But very cool. Cool. Yeah. So, so, so that was I kind of knew more about that, and I also I used to love Lucy in the Sky of Diamonds uh, because I I got given it, but I didn't know that it was a Beatles song. I thought it was Elton John song. No, oh. <laughs> but then and then I did, and then obviously I did discover the Beatles, and like you know, then then it becomes an obsession until you've kind of yeah. you've listened to everything and kind of assimilated the whole thing. But but then you know, like other amazing things came into my life, you know. But, I mean, it was one yeah. of the very early influences, obviously. Very cool. I've seen your um, your house, describe, your, the house you grew up in, described as bohemian. And I know what that means in America, but what does that mean in London? I, I did, till I was nine, I lived in London when I moved to the, to the Essex countryside. Bohemian, I suppose in the sense that my, dad's an, my dad was, like, very into, uh, lastly, into arts education my mum's always been an artist painter and creates installations and everything really just everything is and yeah I've got lots just lots of artists in my family it's just pretty normal yeah so it wasn't I mean I don't know I guess I picture sort of just like people sitting around on pillows and smoking hookahs and yeah that like sort that. of thing I mean it was a bit like that in the late 60s yeah, my dad, amongst many things he did, he created happenings and uh, uh, psychedelic buildings in weird places. In fact, once he kind of worked with the soft machine and they did a concert in the south of France and uh, he thought it would be a really good idea to go out the night before because it was on, 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 on a beach. He went out into the bay and he doused the whole bay in, in uh, petrol and then... <laughs> When they came on that evening, he lit it, so they had this amazing, kind of, very dangerous, and often no one would ever let you do that now. But that, hey, it was the 60s. I mean, but, I, but you know, I just heard all of this uh, through, you know, just the, the, the thing that all families have, which are like these stories, you know, yeah. that you want to hear again and again and again. Totally, the family yeah. lore. Yeah, exactly, the family lore, exactly. I don't know if you went through, like, an early experimentation drug phase when you're in teenager or whatever but were they cool with that like could you talk to them about oh yeah my parents were all always very good with all my uh yeah my dalliances you know they didn't necessarily think i was being very responsible sometimes but i mean they they they, they were never judgmental ever yeah 
I read that your primary school burnt down like seven or eight times. Yeah, that's true. Why? What is that about? Well, it turned out that our form teacher was a complete psychopath. But the sad thing is that the 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 school caretaker, the school caretaker was blamed initially, and he had a heart attack because he was so distressed that that anyone could think he'd do anything like that. And then, but it kept happening, and it really disrupted two years of my education like terribly. And then in the end, it turned out it was our teacher who'd been burning the school down. Yeah. Was it big fires or was it just like little? Yeah, yeah. Well, like like classrooms and stuff. But I mean, once wow. we, we'd done this whole project of raising all these hamsters and then he burnt the hamsters as well, which, you know, is like, was not nice. That's like serial killer stuff. Yes. I mean, yeah. I mean, sort of Essex in the 1980s was a fairly errant place, to be fair. We're taking a quick break and then coming back with more from Leah Rose and Damon Albarn. We're back with more from Damon Albarn and Leah Rose. As a kid, like, what was, how did you find music? What was the first music that you felt was like really spoke to you? Oh, I, I was more family law. I had a, a harmonica that was in my cot, which I used to play. I've always, I've always been interested in music. Yeah, I went through quite conventional education, musical education, classical. And then I just sort of, with Graham, discovered other kinds of ways of playing music, you know, and here I am now. What were you guys into music-wise? Were you into punk or were you, like, what was the new wave? What was the... Yeah, well, I mean, it, a lot of our... Early stuff is comes directly from Thursday night on top of the pops. You know, it was a national obsession with the youth, really. Well, it felt like that where I lived. That was my connection with everything, you know, top of the pops. Clothes, music, hairstyles. How much did you guys think about the way that you looked, like the aesthetic look of Blur when you first started? Was there a lot of thought put into the haircuts and the clothes? Um, there was a lot of thought put into making it not look like there's a lot of thought put into it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was just a classic art school band, really. Yeah. You know, slightly foppish, slightly foppish, slightly disheveled, but kind of, you know, cool. Yeah, but the hair was always good. Yeah, we had good hair. We had good hair. Like, it looks disheveled, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, remarkably, we've still pretty much all got our hair, which is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> honestly... That's quite a thing. A At 55, it's definitely yeah. not something to uh, take for granted, for sure. You know? It's true. But yeah, I've always wondered that because you always look cool and it's like how much thought. I'm just curious how still you look cool. You have cool outfits. You obviously make cool choices with what you wear. Oh, I mean, I mean, you know, we, we, we were in secondhand shops from day one. I mean, yeah. it's, our, it's one of our greatest joys, especially Graham and I. You know, we yeah. just love shopping for old clothes. Yeah, but there, you still, you have to be good at it. Like someone yeah, like Andre 3000, like always looks cool. Oh, yeah. We could walk into the same shop and... No, of course, but it's like it's like everything. Practice makes perfect, you know? Yeah. It's like, it's like all those things that you tried on that really didn't work, but you put down. And I bought a lot of stuff that I was convinced was um, a major statement in fashion that I, when I got home, it was like... And these days I have... I mean, my daughter, because she's uh, at London School of Fashion... Very oh, serious, cool. very, very serious about everything related to that. I mean, I can't get away with anything anymore. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like I have to really be at my top A game every day. Otherwise, she will call me out. Yeah. So does she like your style? Well, I think so. I mean, I'm her dad, you know what I mean? I can't. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I mean, I'm never going to be have as much drip as other people. But, <laughs> yeah. I'm, you know. Yeah. Do you remember, I was reading about your first Blur's first tour in America, and mm. it sounds like it was a bit of a disaster. I don't know if that's accurate, but do you remember first going on the road and playing shows in the States? Oh, uh, they weren't all a disaster, but we did play quite a lot of kind of sort of Midwest towns where no one had an idea who we were at all, you know, which is, yeah. is part, part, part of, I mean, I Looking back, it's an incredibly important part of our development. And I mean, recently, especially with Gorillaz, I spent so much time in America. Yeah. 
I've done a lot of playing in America, so I feel I feel very comfortable and at home in America these days. Yeah. Ironically, I feel very at home in America these days. I've even got my LA hat on. I know. I yeah. it seems like you like that hat. I'm seeing I, it a lot. I know it right. I've literally I can't get rid of the fucking hat. I love it. Is it just the same hat every time? It's the same hat. I dropped, <laughs> I bought so many hats since I got this hat, and nothing, nothing kicks like this hat. But it's totally the wrong hat for Blur. I shouldn't be wearing a hat like this. I should be wearing. I shouldn't be wearing a hat. I mean, I don't wear a hat on stage, obviously. But and all the clothes that I kind of sort of, you know, the whole look that I've got. Yeah. But I've thought about everything. It's just ruined when I put this hat on. So I can't really wear the hat. I shouldn't really be wearing the hat in this podcast, but I just, I can't help it. But, but, you, but you're right. I literally, I mean, I haven't washed it either since I've had it. And it was about 30 years old when I bought it. Really? I That's mean, this, cool the, this, is, this is a truly loved hat. Yeah, it's a cool hat. It's gotten broken in over the years. I've watched a lot of your videos. Yeah. <laughs> and in the beginning, it was a little bit more stiff. Yeah, okay. I saw you had so it what, at Coachella. What, what are you trying to say about my hat? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing. It's like a nice pair of leather shoes. It is. It, it, it is. But, but I mean, the only other kind of hats that I really feel comfortable in are, be- are like old fisherman's beanie hats, you know, like classic. Uh-huh, those are cool. Yeah, but I can't wear them in the summer. Too hot. Too hot. Every, nothing else. I've, I've got, I found some nice old deer stalkers that I might be able to get away with, but it's been so hot, really. This is the only hat I can yeah. wear. <laughs> it seems like, I don't know if this is true, but was Gorillaz the, f- the first project where the music really super resonated with Americans? Uh, well, no, Song 2 was. But no one knew who made Song 2. It's just that ubiquitous woohoo song. Yeah. There'd probably be people, probably people who listen to this go, no, they didn't do that, did they? You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> it's so sort of dis- detached from us. Yeah. But uh, yes, that, that's our biggest song by far, obviously. Yeah. After you make a song too, do you want to incorporate a little woohoo or something similar in every... You want to make, you definitely want to make a song free, but it's quite, it's harder, yes. it's harder than you think. <laughs> it seems very difficult, but... I don't know. I just feel like I would be tempted if you get something that really sticks. Yeah. Well, I've had a few, but, not, you know, but then as Frank Sinatra said, I've had too few to mention. Yeah. <laughs> That's really poor. That's a really, 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 really poor joke. It's a poor joke. I apologize for that. I'm, I, it always come, goes wrong when I try and be amusing. <laughs> Have you ever tried to analyze what works in America versus what works in the UK or in Europe? Is that something that you even think of when you're making music, or you just? No, I don't. I don't think about. I don't think about it. I just, you know, you make and then you just wait. Do you care, or are you just making to make? Uh, I, I'm existing to make. It must be so nice to have such a clear passion. Yes, I mean it's it's. Uh, I mean it's condition, isn't it? You know, I've got. I have some. These days, it yeah. would be it would be on a spectrum somewhere. You know, I, I, it's it's got a name, I'm sure. I just haven't chosen to go down that path to to be analysed. Is it near constant? Is it something you can always rely on, or does it ever leave you? The ability to make new songs. Well, well I, I, it's like yoga. I do try and do yoga every day, and I try to write every day. I get up basically in the morning unless you can be disciplined enough to do it in the evening which i can't are you working on any new gorillas music i've done a few tunes i'm doing an opera at the moment about using goethe's fragment he he wrote of the uh, magic flute part two which is fascinating very cool you've heard of the magic flute haven't you mozart's magic yeah well goethe who's a contemporary of mozart wrote part two of that like you know the sequel uh, but it never got put to music oh, okay so it's this it's this it's this, this legendary lost thing wow yeah it's really interesting i mean i don't know very cool what i'm doing i've never really known what i'm doing in that world at all i'm a complete and utter idiot <laughs> but you were trained with in music theory and everything yeah right? i can yeah i mean i, I you know I, I i can i don't know whether it's any good put it that way i you know Whereas with songs, I'm kind of more confident about that. Yeah. 
Okay, so new gorillas. You're working on new gorillas. Uh, a bit, yeah. We're gonna do. We're gonna do something. Uh, it's gonna be a um, not as dramatic as a quantum ship. A, uh, a paradigm. Be a paradigm shift. Which just be very different. No cartoons. Uh, yeah, but v- v- just an entirely different approach to everything. To the to the the band to everything. We're just at a point where we're we're going to change. Why? <laughs> Why? Why does it feel like it's time Why? for a because, because it was always just Jamie and I. So, you know, really, yeah. uh, although it's a very big thing now, it's, yeah. it's still, in essence, is two people. So if we mm-hmm. decide between us that we want to do something unrecognizable, then we will. That's exciting. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, you need that, don't you, to, yeah. for it to keep, to stay alive, really. Definitely, that's cool. So when about do you think that will start surfacing? Well, I'll, I will keep writing, but I, uh, until I've kind of written the opera, I can't really do anything much else other than that. But, you know, you know I might write it really quickly. I'm, it's got to be next autumn anyway, so before that, I'll, so I'll, I'll be working on gorillas. We're going to pause for one last quick break and then come back with Leah Rose and Damon Albarn. We're back with Leah Rose and Damon Albar. What's the significance of the the album title? Ballad of Darren. Well, Darren Darren's a very very old friend of everyone in the band. He's been kind of sort of there in various reincarnations since almost day one, and we have this group of very close friends who work with us and have always worked with us, and he's one of them. So therefore, he represents all of us. So the Ballad of Darren is, is Darren is in this moment, the everyman, you know? Did he go through something significant recently? Well, I mean, we've all been through significant things, you know? I mean, obviously, as I wrote the songs, it's probably, I've probably been through some significant things as well. But, uh-huh. you know, I mean, I am a, I am a, a certified sad 55-year-old. I hear you. I feel sad too. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. I'm, it happens. I mean, I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm not afraid of sadness. You know. Yeah, but you're productive. You're a productive 55 year old. I'm. I'm. I'm a pr- pr- very productive sado. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. So this album, when I first started listening to it, it feels like it needs, like you know, like a pair of shoes. Sometimes you need a a break in period. Yeah. This album just there's no break in period. It immediately. Sounds good. Oh, good. I got in there really easy. I woke up yesterday singing The Narcissist. It was just, it was there. It's in my consciousness. Do you have any sort of tricks or little formulas that you've developed at this point for making something just go down easy? Well, what's the song in My Fair Lady? A little bit of sugar helps the medicine go down. Would the sugar come in the melody? Um, I don't know. I mean... It's certainly not in the lyrics. The lyrics are rarely uplifting, but I suppose it's that juxtaposition with the music that creates, you know, it's the classic REM, it's the end of the world kind of thing, isn't it? You know what I mean? Where you are singing, it's like um, Spike Milligan, you're probably not familiar with him. He's a brilliant comedian, writer, and on his gravestone he had inscribed, uh, he had inscribed, I told you I wasn't feeling well. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's that that is in the joy and sadness of life. It's kind of, you know, that final victory that makes people laugh. And yet, I suppose in a way, that's kind of sort of the essence of melancholy. You know, it's that sort of mm-hmm. realisation that you are both living and living your best and dying your best life. Hmm. Is there like an overall emotional framework to the album? Or how would you describe the vibe? I think once they catch you, certain songs will play with your emotions quite heavily. You know, songs like the Everglades, I think, will smack people around the face at one point. Mm-hmm. I mean, so it's got that. It's in there, but it doesn't. it's not going to scare anyone away, you know what I mean? I don't think. But I mean, I, I can't talk about my own work. I just All I can do is make it and then sing it. 
do you ever have any trepidation about putting vo- about writing vulnerable lyrics or exposing a, a part of your experience? Yeah, I suppose. I mean, I suppose in many ways this is my vulnerable, but I think vulnerability is by singing about it, you're you're somehow kind of easing it. You know, you're, the vulnerability is diminished by your ability to express it. Through writing songs, does it help you understand your emotions or is it just a way to talk about it and share emotions? Yeah, but I I, I, I don't like make it all about myself strictly. It's mm-hmm. kind of I use I use where I where I'm at in my life and how I feel as a kind of tool to talk about other things sometimes, you know. It's that you know, it was quite a lot of politics on the record as well. I mean politics affiliated not 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 partisan politics but you know what i mean it's like in russian strings mm-hmm. say that there are there are strings attached to all of us you know that we're all complicit and therefore you know what are we doing how did the the narcissist come about do you how did that song come to be well i think i think it's kind of sort of maybe is kind of came about from my belief that we're living in the most narcissistic age of, of epoch of man's man, basically. I don't know if you can get any more narcissistic than he is now. Mm-hmm. Or she, it, they are now, or whatever we are. You know, collectively, we're, 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 we're living through this. Do you talk about that with your daughter since she's you know, at a young age where this just feels normal. Yeah, she she thinks, you know, like, understandably that... Uh, I mean, she's called me a boomer on a couple of occasions, which I'm sure is not a good thing. Are you a boomer? I don't think so. Aren't you Gen X? I really have no idea what I am. But boomer is surely before me. I can't be a boomer. No, I? I don't think you're a boomer. I think you're Gen X. I'm a, no, but I think she's been doubly rude by calling me a boomer. <laughs> I think it's intentionally... I mean, I deserve it so it's fine um no i um no I, I, just, I just think by the very nature of the way we go about our business and where we communicate with each other and our ability to send pictures of ourselves and our ability to yeah. distort those pictures to to filter those pictures to create narrative through those pictures of ourselves and our expressions we we, we are in love with the image of ourselves which is the essence of the original story of narcissus you know, and we do live in an echo chamber, which is another key component of the original, not the echo chamber, but echo being the counterpoint to Narcissus that he couldn't hear, he couldn't see, he couldn't kind of externalise any empathy for anyone. He's just about himself and his image. Do you feel that when you're playing in you know, in different countries all over the world? Like if you're going over to Mali or you're playing somewhere in Africa, do you feel that same force there or is that a total escape uh, culturally? Well, I mean, not as much as it used to be because the yeah. world's changed and everyone is, everyone, everywhere, anyone who's got a phone <laughs> is yeah. is in on it, aren't they, in one form or another. So that reason I don't have a phone. You have an iPad, right? I do have an iPad, but, you know, it's just not the same thing. You can't whip out the iPad. You know, it's quite, it's a sort of, it's an event, getting an iPad to take a photograph. It's not be like, very boomerish. You, you, exactly. You can't do it with one hand. It's impossible. You have to have two hands. Yeah. And the whole point is this immediacy of boom, there you go. That was where I started. But really, the song is about a story of my own kind of, uh, you know, from being a kid in a, in my bedroom looking in the mirror and using an old strobe light that my dad uh, had given me, which he'd used in the UFO club uh, with Pink Floyd back in the early 60s. What's the UFO club? It was a, it was a very famous club where, where, where uh, Pink Floyd started. It's like a cool place in the early 60s where people played. And he had the strobe light, and he gave me this strobe light. So I had my synthesizer a mirror, strobe light, and I switch off my bedroom light, so I'd be in the dark just with the strobe flickering. I'd put on whatever record I, or I wanted to transport myself to and, you know, 
So that was my kind of weird narcissism. And then, uh, and then I just sort of traced the, the journey, really, of, of, of the band during that song. That's so cool. So would you kind of just, like, watch yourself in the mirror and practice yeah. dance moves and things like that? Yeah, but in strobe all the time. I don't know if anyone would ever be allowed to have something quite so mind my. I mean, you know, I really didn't need any any other drugs when I having a strobe like that. I had it had a dial, so you could go from very slow to very fast. Very cool. Do you feel when you write songs that a lot of it is inspired from when you were a kid and when you were a teenager? Like, does everything feel like it comes from that? Well, no, not really. I mean, it just comes. It comes from the. Uh, portable well I carry around with myself. So there's still things today that are inspiring oh, yeah, I mean, new music. It's not... Oh, 100%. No, this whole record is completely kind of informed by how I feel about what's happening now in my life, mm -hmm. in everyone's lives. Have you ever thought about if you didn't do this, what you would be interested in doing? What you feel like you'd be really good at? I honestly don't think I'd be good at anything else. I mean, I do sometimes think, it's like, how would I have been... How would I have fared in like a, an early Viking community? Yeah. Because uh, I went once to a, a beach where they have five stones in, uh, outside of Reykjavik uh, in Iceland. And these stones have been there for a thousand years. And basically, depending on, on which stone you could lift and take to the shoreline, you were allocated a job within the community. Wow. And I couldn't lift the, the, the heaviest stone, which was the one reserved for people who travelled. So I wasn't going to be doing any travelling. People who rode, basically, you know, they had to... I, but I, I, I was able to pick up the one before that, so I suppose I'd have been... That's good. I would have worked, worked the land, maybe, and hopefully, you know, been able to write and play music and sing. When you sit down to play with somebody new... Do you ever feel that you have to impress that person? Are you nervous? Like, what's the feeling in you? Uh, I mean, you, you, you want them to feel comfortable and have a sense that, you know, you're not completely incompetent. Yeah, but I mean, really, it's about, it's about the shared sort of experience, isn't it? And, you know, we, I think all writers and s singers in my world, the good ones understand the sort of um, the aspect of connecting with the spirit. Mm-hmm. And so that's that's the main objective, really. If you can call on the spirit, then whatever you make will have some kind of value to it. Is there any way to encourage the spirit? <laughs> yeah, many ways, many ways, really. Uh, I mean, sometimes people like to have a drink. Sometimes like people like to smoke weed. Sometimes people just like a cup of tea. But I think it's just about that been sensing, sensitive enough to each other that you can kind of pick up on the, whatever vibration mm -hmm. is being made. Yeah, speaking of people you've worked with, is there anybody who's just collaboration-wise you've started to play with where it's just an instant click? Yeah, um, I mean, luckily, well, I mean, okay, someone like Bobby Womack, as soon as you sit down with a piano with Bobby Womack, he just has to sing one note and yeah. That's incredible. I saw that um, some of your fans on Instagram were commenting and they saying they wanted you to slow down and take care of yourself and get some rest. Well, I've just had four days off, so there you go. <laughs> are, you, do you, are you in constant perpetual motion? Yes. You know what I say about Rolling Stones. But I'm happy at some point. I, I understand by the, the sheer law, law of physics and gravity... I will, I will eventually stop and, you know, then I'll be more than happy to be completely disappear in the moss. Is that what you want to do, disappear in the moss? Well, I think it sounds like quite a nice environment to sleep eternally. It seems like the album is a bit of a, maybe a comment on morality. Yeah, I suppose that's there. It's kind of, there's a lot of yeah. questions posed within the record yeah I, I don't think it's judgmental I really I'm really not in a position to judge anyone as I say in St. Charles Square it's I fucked up but I'm not the first to do it so that's my kind of my one of my opening gambits really do you pay attention 
to reviews about what critics are writing about the work? Uh, well, if I was disingenuous, I'd say no. <laughs> of course. Of course I do. I mean, I'm always interested. But I mean, if there's a kind of sort of, uh, there's like a slightly mad moment when the record is out there. Yeah. And you sort of get some, start to get some feedback where, you know, I mean, I pick up on it a bit. I'm not like obsessed by it. And then it's and then and then that's it. It's finished. Just no, yeah. I don't care anymore. You know, so sort of, it usually lasts a few days, but it's definitely a madness. Does it bring you down or what? When um, people don't like it, I suppose if everyone didn't like something that I put a lot of work into, it might be a bit sort of. I might I might kind of be feel a bit low. Yeah, but. I mean, it's never like that, really. But it's so nice that you have the experience of going out and playing for people because you get to see the effect on people. Well, you see, and, that, that, and that's the wonderful thing about finishing something and, and playing it almost simultaneously. You really, you know, while you're still kind of sort of under its spell, you can cast that on other people. Yeah, it must just be so great. It feels so good, exhilarating. Yeah, it's great. It's, 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 it's a good feeling, for sure. Has your crowds changed a lot yeah i mean there's sort of there's people from our generation and people from this generation there but the gorillas audience is really young yeah really young i That's mean sometimes i mean it's just crazy sometimes i kind of go into the audience and i go quite deep into the audience and sort of in the middle of the mosh pit almost there's like a five-year-old with headphones on it's it's amazing it's wonderful i mean just just the most wonderful audiences yeah i've had some most Beautiful experiences playing live in America with Grizz. Right. Yeah, your the Coachella set was so good. I streamed it this year. Yeah, I, 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 it's a wonderful band. So you know, it felt very joyous. Yeah, it is. It, it generally is. Yeah, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me. Thanks to Damon Albarn for talking to Leah Rose about Blair's new album, The Ballad of Daring. You can hear that record along with all of the favorite songs from Blur, Gorillaz, and Damon Albarn's various solo works on a playlist at brokenrecordpodcast.com. Broken Record is produced with help from Leah Rose, Jason Gambrell, Ben Tolliday, Nisha Venkut, Jordan McMillan, and Eric Sandler. Our editor is Sophie Crane. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries. And if you like the show, remember to share, rate, and review us on your podcast app. Our theme music's by Ken Beats. I'm Justin Richmond.